Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, ecological and political crises that we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. My guest this week is Max Wilbert. Max has spent his life protesting the climate crisis and the political and economic mechanisms that engender it. He's dedicated himself to understanding the systems that are in place that drive our ecological destruction. And because of that, has also spent a lot of time calling out the environmental movement for what it is. And the mainstream environmental movement, he says, is bullshit. It's the kind of movement that says, you can drive an electric vehicle, that's fine, that's green. Or the energy transition will happen, we'll just go to renewables and life will continue as usual. Uh, (laughs) Max is the co-author of a book, Bright Green Lies, which exposes the mainstream environmental movement for the fallacies that it peddles in order to continue business as usual. This is a wide-ranging and wonderful conversation with somebody who has been in the middle of the climate movement for, God, two decades more. He has a wonderful understanding of how all the different pieces fit together. I really enjoy that he spends a lot of his time calling out mainstream environmentalism as a journalist who also spends a lot of her time calling out greenwashing. So that was good fun. (laughs) I hope you all enjoy this episode as much as I did. If you do enjoy it, please share it far and wide. If you're loving the show, support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. And a huge thank you to the Planet Critical community who keep this project going. Max, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Glad to be with you. So tell me a little bit how you got into what you, you call it radical environmental activism. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and many people may remember back in 1999, there was a massive protest there against the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, It turned into a big confrontation. There was a lot of tear gas deployed. There were these sort of running street battles between police and protesters. That's the political environment that I sort of grew up in. Mm. So at the time, I think I was 11 years old. I wasn't actually at the protest, but my dad dad went, my sister went. I grew up in a family that had been protesting the Vietnam War, protesting uh, during the civil rights movement, uh, anti-apartheid, and so on. So it wasn't unusual for me as a kid to be riding on my dad's shoulders at a protest. Mm. And when I first started to learn about environmentalism, it was sort of the stereotypical environmentalism of the 90s, early 2000s, you know, stop cutting down the rainforest, that type of Mm. thing, Mm. which it's very easy to understand as a kid why that's wrong. And because the rainforest has monkeys and monkeys are cool. (laughs) (laughs) But it started to expand from there a little bit from me. Um, One story that I often tell is I went to an environmental fair And there were all these booths, environmental organizations, and so on. And one of them had a uh, Hummer that was powered by biodiesel. Right. This, yeah, exactly. (laughs) This was probably around 2004. So the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan had kicked off, and the Hummer has become this symbol of militarism, of American excess, of war for oil, and so on. And here we have this biodiesel Hummer. And you can see what the guy was trying to do, right? He's trying to uh, push that symbol in a different direction. He's trying to take the form, but, you know, change the underlying fuel, literally. But for me, that really rubbed me in the wrong way. I'll and that was, that was one of the first moments that I realized that environmentalists lie. And environmentalists can take us in the wrong direction by having the wrong framing conditions um, for their thinking or their projects or their campaigns. So, you know, from there, I, I, I went into a lot of the personal change stuff. Like mm-hmm. I think so many of us do. I became a vegetarian. I was riding my bike everywhere I could. I was learning about hypermiling. I don't know if you know what that is. What is that? It's like a, 
it's this weird niche community of environmentalist geeks who try and figure out, okay, I have to drive a car sometimes because I live in a car culture. So I'm going to try and get the absolute best possible gas mileage I can. I'm going to okay. figure out how to take this car that normally gets 20 miles a gallon and get 40 miles a gallon on it All by right. essentially driving like a grandpa. <laughs> Oh, right. Okay. Driving very slowly, trying to break as little as possible, like <laughs> planning your routes to avoid hills, all this type of, you know, stuff. So I got into all this really personal change stuff. And I see some good in that for sure. I think we all should be critically looking at our own consumption, our own patterns of behavior, uh, the way we've been indoctrinated by culture or advertising to behave in certain ways. But there are obviously limits to that. Mm. So I'm, I'm sure you understand this. I think almost everyone who's an environmentalist understands this. You try and convince other people to do it. You're like, oh, I, I, I rewash my plastic bags and reuse them as many times as I can until they're literally falling apart. And other people just look at you like you're crazy. You know? <laughs> they look at you like, who is this nut job? And... So I got depressed for a while. I, you know, I got really down because I felt like, okay, nobody is actually changing their behavior. Mm. Here I am trying to swim against the current mm. in this society. And I'm trying to convince other people to change their diet, change their lifestyle, change their behavior. And nobody's doing it. Mm. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a kid, you, you have this naive idea that people can do that, that people can change their behavior. And now, of course, I understand that oftentimes these are really personal choices. They're societal forces, right? Yeah. People don't have too many options. You know, obviously, if you're poor, you can't afford yeah. great organic local food. Uh, yeah. You know, you've got to go to Walmart or whatever store and buy whatever you can afford. And, you know, same with having a car or uh, whatever other personal lifestyle change you want to talk about. Mm. Um, so I was depressed for a while and then I came across radical environmentalists and they helped me understand this isn't just a personal issue. These are social issues. They're political issues. These are systemic problems. Yeah. And they're largely caused by systemic forces that are outside of our control. You know, yeah. I, I never voted on cars existing. I'm sure yeah. you didn't vote on cars existing or whether or not we should live in a car culture or anything like that. We're just yeah. born into it, right? Yeah. There's a lot of momentum. There's a lot of power and um, inertia. And so we're swept along in that current. And we can try to swim against that current, but it's very difficult. And many people will try for a little while and then they'll get swept downstream again. Yeah. And so, you know, once you realize that, then it makes it easier to interrogate the issues at a at a deeper level. These yeah, yeah, yeah. become issues of politics and power and society and class and uh, uh, larger mm -hmm. than just personal decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's sort of what kicked me on the path of radical environmentalism was starting to understand those issues and starting to understand that the destruction of the planet isn't really a mistake, mm. you know. We focus so much on education and telling people this is why plastic is destructive. This is why global warming is a big problem. This is why species extinction is bad. This is uh, the glaciers are melting this fast and it's a big problem. That's useful, but education only gets you so far because the destruction of the planet isn't a mistake. It's not a misunderstanding. It's not an accident. It's largely a deliberate process driven by economics and the material reality of the society we live in. You know, every, everything that, that we produce and consume in an industrial civilization is dependent upon the destruction of the planet, largely. You know, whether it's the wood in that uh, ladder that you see behind me that's cut down with chainsaws out of a living forest, or whether it's the plastic in these headphones I'm wearing, or even the wool in this hat that I have on my head. You know, these sheep were grazed somewhere that was uh, probably previously a meadow mm. uh, full of wildlife. Or mm. maybe it was a forest that was cut down and made into a meadow. 
So there are costs to all of these things. And, uh, you know, the issues are much bigger than than we can solve with individual action alone. Absolutely. I I think for me, rather than looking at it as like it, it's a deliberate process, I find it easier to think of it as it's a symptom of the systemic issue um, and framing climate change as this sort of accident in and of itself that exists out with any other paradigm is a huge part of like the greenwashing wave that keeps anyone from being able to tackle it in any way. Mm. Um, I think that there's, oh God, it's so difficult, isn't it? Because then sometimes you do read things and you do investigate things and you do come across absolute nut jobs that um, are hell bent on destroying the environment around us because for whatever reason they think they can survive it. Um, but still treating it as a sy symptom of a paradigm, again, I think that gives people the requisite power, empowerment mm. to also mm -hmm. do something and to do something that is beyond personal change. Because whilst personal change is important, because I think, you know, as citizens, we do need to take responsibility. Like, who are we voting for? What choices are we making? But then you map that beyond your diet. You map that onto like, well, how am I engaging with my community? And how is my community engaging with other communities? And, you know, try and creating a, a system of, uh, I don't know, just citizenship. To me, mm -hmm. the climate crisis so much comes down to citizenship now. I think that is the only way that we can confront it. One of the things that I want to touch on though, and we will touch on everything, um, is what I find really interesting about your work is like you spend a lot of time calling out environmentalists. And I really resonate with that because as a journalist, like my beat is calling out greenwashing because I think there's enough people calling out like the fossil, like we know the fossil fuel industry is bad, but what about the people that are pretending to be good? Um, but do you think that it is helpful to still even call them environmentalists? Like why not just call them greenwashers? Why allow them that yeah. label? Absolutely. Well, I think the first reason is that they use that label themselves. And the second reason is that people believe them. <laughs> right. So, you know, I think your framing is right. You're totally on the money, but, um, but it's still what people understand. And it's, mm. you know, this, this problem has gotten so bad, you know, and that's one of the things we talked about in Bright Green Lies is that our framing of environmentalism has shifted so much over the past few decades. Even back in the early 2000s, when I was really first getting involved as an environmentalist, it was about the forests. It was mm. about the species. It was about the spotted owls. It was about the whales. It was about uh, the grasslands and the deserts and the non-human beings, right? And the actual planet itself. Now, environmentalism has become synonymous with climate change, with global right. warming. And global warming has become synonymous with a threat to industrial civilization. Yes. So the way that we say this in the book is that we're solving for the wrong variable. The environmental movement, instead of being about saving the planet and stopping the destruction of the natural world, has become about how do we save industrial civilization? How do we save the very thing that is causing the destruction of the planet? Mm. And that's, you know, that's, this sort of gets back to what you said, Rachel, about, you know, you were challenging what I said about the destruction of the, the planet being deliberate, right? And you were saying that it is a consequence of the paradigm that we live in. And I think, I think you're right and I'm right. I think we're both mm -hmm. sort of covering different, different perspectives on the same issue. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say it the way I do is because economic growth in the system that we live in is dependent upon the destruction of the natural world. I think actually yes. one of your guests talked about this, Nate Hagens. Uh, I don't do. remember whether it was on your show <laughs> or one of his other presentations. I've listened to a few of his things, but he was talking about there's a one-to-one -one correlation between material extraction and GDP, GDP. growth, yeah. right? Yeah. So literally, mm. economic success in our society is defined as the destruction of the natural world, mm. whether it's ripping up mountains or cutting down forests or vacuuming fish out of oceans or what have you. 
So I don't think that's, I don't think that's an accident. And, you know, with that said, it's also the way you say it is also true. That's a paradigm. And I like the way you say it because it leaves the, it leaves the door open for change, right? It leaves the door open for this is the paradigm we have now. We could live in a different way. Mm. And I think you're right that it's not, it's not all deliberate in the, in the sort of most colloquial sense of that word. You know, there are people out there who, for example, here in the United States, hate wolves. And they just, if they see a wolf, they want to kill it. They want to shoot it. They want to poison it, trap it, whatever. And that's sort of a very blatant hatred of, of the wild, right? Mm. But sometimes hatred is felt so deeply and for so long that it becomes the background. And it no longer feels like hatred. It just feels like economics. It feels like <laughs> politics. It feels like yeah. the way things are. Yeah. And that's really how, that's really the world that I think we live in today. Mm. I mean, think about how many people, when they see a bug, their response is like, oh, gross, a bug, mm. you know, that's disgusting. That's ingrained hatred of the natural world, right? Oh, I mean, there's elements to that also of... Um, bugs bite us and they crawl on us and it doesn't feel good and so on. That's sort of natural, of course, right? But that's an extension of the worldview that humans must control everything around us, that we must impose our domination on the land, you know? And this plays out in so many different ways. It's really deeply embedded in our culture. And I think we underestimate the power of that at our own peril. Mm. Um, and I'll, I'll finish up because I know you want to say something and I really want to hear it. <laughs> but um, I think we underestimate the power of that at our own peril because mm. this leads to big problems. Mm. And one of the biggest examples that I've been grappling with right now is the mainstream environmental movement and the promotion of solar energy, wind energy, electric cars, geothermal, et cetera, all these technological solutions, quote unquote, mm as the answer to the climate crisis. Mm. That to me is a prototypical example of human supremacism completely destroying the thing that it is purporting to be about, right? Completely undermining and twisting environmentalism into a new greenwashing that says it's about saving the planet, but in reality is producing the exact same type of destruction as fossil fuels. <laughs> oh, there's so much. There's so much, isn't it? Right. Okay. What? Okay. One thing to about the human supremacy. This is what's sparking off in my mind is the conversation I had with Carl Safina about the roots of our human dissonance with the natural world uh, being found in like Plato's profanity, his concept of profanity, and then that being indoctrinated through um, theology. Essentially, that you know we are actually not built for this world. We are built for another better place um, and the natural world is there for something to not be respected i but also listening to you i'm thinking about um for example uh in malaysia a lot of the stuff that we cover is the incredible greed of the different royal families because there's like five of them um and how they will just happily rape their uh home state's rainforests um in order to produce more personal economic wealth so there seems to be, like, perhaps that hatred that you're um, talking about has become, like, sublimated through action to the extent that it appears that the destruction of the natural world is an accident uh, that is driven by the decoupling of understanding of, like, well, if you want resources to create economic wealth, you're going to have to take them from somewhere. There just, there just seems to be the strange cognitive dissonance between understanding what resources actually are and how we use them and what they produce. And then also perhaps that long-standing tradition of being uncomfortable uh, in the world that we live in. And we could go metaphysics here, but I really feel like, like this is probably not the podcast for that. <laughs> it's mine. I mean, it could be. <laughs> but let's get into some of these bright green lies about energy. Because in one thing that you're saying, you know, about solar and wind and all this stuff, they're not perfect solutions. Um, the amount of fossil fuel energy that it creates um, in order to produce renewable energy is still far, far, far too much. 
we need to be thinking about mitigating our oil resources in order to continue investing in potential solutions or just things that are like better. Um, but still, I mean, we do need to find a way to maintain food systems, to supply heat to people that need it, to supply cooling to people that need it. We, there's, there's, there's 8 billion of us and we cannot just switch to an oh natural mode of living overnight because billions of people will die. So what part of the renewable sector, for example, like forget electric cars, we know they're bullshit, but like the renewable sector, what part of that is the lie in particular that you think is um, so damaging? Because is there not an argument to be made that, well, we are going to have to find a new energy source? Why it's not nuclear? And I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it, but like why it's not nuclear? I don't know, because nuclear just seems to be the thing that we need for now. Um, what, I mean, is there any benefit to um, pretending to transition to renewables uh, at all? Like what, what part of it do you find just so destructive? Well, there are a couple pieces. There's a, there's a lot to go, a mm. lot of different directions to go here. Let's do it. So first, it's really important that people understand that no source of energy that human civilization has ever used has declined. And so what I mean by that is, you know, before fossil fuels, before nuclear, before all that, it was wood, right? Well, it was mm. muscle power, it was human and animal power, a lot of slaves, mm. and it was burning wood. Mm -hmm. When humans started burning coal, mm. they didn't stop burning wood. They added coal on top. Yes. Right? And then they started pumping oil and burning oil. Wood didn't decline. Coal didn't decline. Oil was added on top. Then natural gas, then mm. nuclear power, then hydro, now solar, wind, geothermal, etc. All of these energy sources have added on to what came before. And... There's actually a lot of scientific research to back this up. Richard York, I'm not familiar, sure if you're familiar with his work, no. but he's somebody who you might be interested in talking with. He's a sociology professor, and he studied, among other things, uh, energy displacement, which is that exact thing that I'm talking about here. It's, you know, when you bring something new online, does the old stuff go away? Yeah. And what he found is that it doesn't. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't go away. Um, so this has been observed multiple times around the world at different scales um, and with different scientific studies that have found that these new renewable energy technologies are not displacing fossil fuels. More coal, more oil, more natural gas is still being burned every year than the year before. And there are functional, yes. So but, I, wait, 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 what about France? France is a country that is, I mean, the vast majority of its energy comes from a nuclear source and it has emissions Absolutely. that are like, I think the, the US uses 15 times energy per capita than it should. Mm -hmm. um, and most other Western nations are not far behind. France, it's like two or three. I mean, that source of nuclear radically changes um, their, their emissions output. Surely that's an example. A good one. I mean, there, there <laughs> are, so there are a few issues here. One. Right is that we're talking about electricity here, not mm. energy. Electricity okay. is one form or type of energy, right? And in general, electricity is only about 20% of overall energy use. So in France, well, I know they're, they're not 100% nuclear. I think it's 80 or something like that. But let's say it's 100%. That means that 20% of their energy use comes from nuclear power overall. Right, because right. only 20% of the energy is electricity. The rest of it is in the form of diesel and gasoline in the trucks, uh, biofuels being burned in different ways, and so on. Right? So this is one very important thing, is that functionally, in this industrial civilization that we live in, fossil fuels are irreplaceable currently. So electric cars represent a tiny fraction of the cars on the road. There are no long haul electric semi trucks. There are no electric uh, ships to bring containers across the ocean. There are no electric transport planes, right? So the vast majority of the economy is driven by liquid fuels, 
Mm -hmm. These are absolutely fundamental. And I just look around you right now. I mean, the microphone that you're talking into, the headphones, the light behind you, the couch or the seat that you're sitting on, the windows next to you, all of those were transported on trucks, Mm. probably multiple trucks and probably shipping containers across the ocean too. Definitely. So functionally, we live in a way that is totally dependent on fossil fuels. Mm. And there, is, there are theoretical ways that this could change in the future, but they're very theoretical for now. There's nothing close to uh, the utility of fossil fuels. I say this as somebody who has, you know, I've stood in front of coal trains to block them. I've climbed up on heavy equipment to try and shut down the tar sands. You know, I'm not a fossil fuel advocate. Mm. And at the same time, we have to recognize that the best lithium ion battery today has uh, that's available to us to buy has about uh, an energy density of one kilojoule per kilogram those units don't really matter but the energy density is one right Mm. diesel fuel has an energy density of 47 Mm. so roughly 50 times higher Mm. and that's because literally it's ancient sunlight all that photosynthesis of those ancient creatures compressed by geologic forces into fossil fuels It is very energy dense Mm -hmm. and uh, other sources of energy don't match that. Yeah. So, you know, there are, and I'll jump back here to, um, you had uh, a guest on your show, Dr. Tim, I'm trying, I'm trying to remember his last name. Tim Garrett. Tim Garrett from University of Utah. Utah, yeah. The snowflake guy. Yeah. (laughs) Fascinating, fascinating guy and very interesting research. I've been following his work for years. He talks about civilization as being a heat engine, right? Mm. That is the way that we need to look at these issues of energy transition. Because France is not an isolated nation. It doesn't really make any sense to look at one country in a global economy and say uh, the energy transition is working in France. Because France is dependent on the uranium being mined in places like Mali to power those nuclear reactors. They're dependent on the goods being pumped out of Chinese factories and shipped around the world to the Mediterranean and trucked up into France. They are dependent upon their trade linkages and economic linkages with uh, their neighbors and with countries around the world. Mm. So in a global economy, the only scale that really makes sense to look at for energy and for global warming is the international scale. And that's largely true across the board, right? So we can look at a country like Costa Rica, for example, they get almost all of their electricity from hydropower. People talk about them as a massive success story for environmentalism, for climate. But a decade ago, 20 years ago, all the environmentalists were fighting dam construction in Costa Rica because dams destroy rivers yeah. and they drive fish to extinction. Yeah. And actually, especially in tropical regions, dams release huge amounts of methane. Yeah. They're an extremely large source of methane. Oh, wait, emissions. hang on. How? How? It's through the process of anaerobic respiration. So, you know, okay. we're, we're aerobic creatures. We breathe in oxygen and we exhale carbon dioxide mm-hmm. as a product of our metabolism. Bacteria are like that too. So, you know, you you leave some broccoli out on the counter, it starts to rot. That's bacteria eating it and breaking down those chemical bonds inside of it. And they release carbon dioxide, just like Mm -hmm. a human being does. Now, uh, some bacteria can also do the same thing, but in the presence of no oxygen. That's called anaerobic respiration. And the product of that is methane. Instead of CO2, it's CH4. And methane is. Uh, one of the most important and significant greenhouse gases. Yep. And uh, it it's about 25 times as powerful as carbon dioxide on a molecule-for-molecule basis yeah. in terms of global warming. And that's what comes out of, you know, if you've ever walked barefoot into a swamp or something like that and you see bubbles coming up from down in the mud, that's methane bubbling up from sticks and leaves and stuff like that, breaking down down in the mud where there's no oxygen. Oh, yeah. so uh, so what part of the, the construction or the, the mechanism of a dam that allows for such bacteria to have anaerobic re- respiration? Right, absolutely. So 
when you build a dam, you have a river beforehand that's running through a valley and you, you build the dam and the water starts to back up and flood that valley. Usually they cut down the forest beforehand, yeah. which releases a lot of carbon dioxide itself. <laughs> yeah. But what's left behind are the roots and lots of branches and leaves and the stumps. Um, all that material gathers in the reservoir as well. So anything that's being washed down from upstream gathers in the reservoir. And it's a low oxygen environment, so you get that anaerobic respiration. Whereas in a stream, um, there is higher oxygen levels because yeah. the water's churning and so on. So there's higher oxygen levels, and some of that material actually goes all the way down to the ocean and then ends up getting buried in sediment and, you know, becomes stone eventually. So that's, mm. a, that's actually a, carbon, a natural carbon sink. Mm. Um, but instead, and, you know, the area of man-made reservoirs and ponds is larger than natural lakes at this point. You know, there's, I there's know that. huge quantities of these have been made around the world. So it's a big increase in in greenhouse gas emissions. God, I did, I did not know that. Yeah, that you know, this thing? is, it's one of those things where it kind of gets left out of the yeah. discussion. It's one of those areas where, like biomass, you know, you're probably familiar with this. Are you in yeah. the UK or Ireland or where UK. are you at? Okay, so uh, in the EU climate rules, they have written into the rules that biomass is considered carbon neutral. So cutting down forests and, and chopping them up into pellets and then burning them is considered carbon neutral because the trees will regrow again, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, renewable source of energy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like if I came up to you and I stole all your money and I said, well, let's just call it money neutral because you're going to earn that money back again <laughs> in the future, right? <laughs> so they call biomass carbon neutral and it's just yeah. written into the rules. It's not based on science. It's not based on the actual data. Yeah, yeah, It's yeah, a yeah. political maneuver. And yeah. we see the same thing with, with these dams is that they're, they've been called carbon, carbon neutral under all of these uh, international climate agreements. And so, mm. you know, organizations like the World Bank have permission to go and finance these massive new dams all over the world, whether it's in the Mekong River Delta, um, on the Congo, in the Amazon Basin, you know, some of these last great riverine wildernesses of the world are facing massive dams coming in that are incre going to be incredibly destructive to the ecology of these places. I mean, the Mekong River in Southeast Asia is home to the largest animal migration on the planet. Larger than salmon spawning, larger than the animals on the Serengeti, larger than the bison herds on the, the American Great Plains who used to live there. Um, and that's the Mekong catfish. There are these massive catfish, and every year they migrate up and down the river to spawn. Huge numbers of them. And uh, that, that, will, that will end if these dams are built. God. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> okay. So, I mean, I think, I think what we're approaching is a message that is frequently broadcasted on this show, which is that um, any transition that doesn't have a degrowth or reduction built into it is a complete fallacy. Um, because ultimately the problem is that not only can we not continue with the amount that we are consuming, but it's just not good for it. It's not good for people. It's not good for planet. It's not good for species, et cetera. Right. Um, I would be curious to find out what other bright green lies there are that you are working to expose, um, the myths that are touted, uh, beyond, you know, EVs, like the whole thing with electric vehicles, it's like, just build public transport, just build better infrastructure, you know, to help people out. Um, what is it about, I don't know, we've kind of touched on renewables. Yeah. What other bright green lines are there that you are desperately concerned are navigating the conversation away from anything actually useful? Well, I think one of the big ones revolves around efficiency. <laughs> I don't know if this is something you've covered on the show before. Jevons, Jevons paradox. paradox. <laughs> yeah. Efficiency and so on. I won't dive too deep into that because I'll assume that your listeners are familiar with that as well. No, but give, give, give it an overview. Well, the Jevons, Stanley, Stanley Jevons, uh, he was an English economist. He was working in the early Industrial Revolution era, and he was studying the productivity of the nation. Um, 
coal consumption was rising rapidly and this was really powering everything in England at the time. So you had steam engines powered by coal. They were pumping out the water out of mine shafts. They were digging mines. They were powering trains, moving freight across the country, um, starting to be used in ships and so on. It was all about coal. And the concern was that uh, coal might run out. And so one of people's responses was they started to make new, more efficient engines to burn the coal, more efficient steam engines. And Jevons studied this issue. He studied the economic, economics of, of coal, uh, the engineering of these different types of engines and so on. And he, what he found was counterintuitive. What he found, what he expected to find was that as the technology becomes more efficient, you'll burn less and less coal, mm. right? It's very obvious. And yet. What he, what he found was the opposite. <laughs> and it's because of a growth imperative, you know? Mm -hmm. So as these businesses adopted more efficient technology, they needed less coal to pump out a mine or move a ton of freight a certain distance. That made them more profitable. And they took that money and they reinvested it in more production and that grew the size of the enterprise overall. Right. That's what we see over and over and over again. So, you know, one of the arguments that we make in Bright Green Lies is sort of a, a metaphor looking at that type of situation. And I'll ask you, I, I'm curious your opinion on this. What would be better for the planet if every car got 99 or 100 miles per gallon or every car got one mile per gallon? Um, uh, sorry, I have to be really annoying and refuse to answer your question in the way that I should. Um, and just, I mean, even like, I'm sure you will explain the science behind this, but like even framing the question in what would be best, um, a slight variation on what, what exists or a slight variation on what mm -hmm. exists. It's like, this is the kind of environment, maybe environmentalism. I'm still mm -hmm. not sure how okay I am with like, you know, using that kind of language, but just in general, the arguments around like how to solve the climate crisis. It's like, well, what if we tweak yeah. this thing? It's like, you, you cannot just tweak the thing. You have, you have to do a new thing. <laughs> there right. has to be a new way of understanding. But please explain the science. <laughs> well, that's the whole point that we're trying to make is All that right. if your cars get one mile per gallon, everyone thinks more efficiency is better. But if your car gets one mile per gallon, you're not going to use it, ah. right? It's going to, I mean, here in the U.S. right now, gas is, is $5.50 a gallon. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go, you know, grab lunch with your friend, that might cost you 20 bucks, mm. you know? Yeah. Extra on top of, on top of everything else. Mm. So it's, there is a disincentive to using the technology in general, to consuming mm. energy in general. And so efficiency tends to create these additional incentives. And we see that across the board. You know, we're looking at electric cars ramping up right now, and you were just critiquing them yourself. But as electric car technology matures, as more and more people adopt it, there are going to be more mines dug. The price of electric cars is going to come down. Uh, there are additional government subsidies for the purchase of these cars and so on. That encourages consumption yeah. and that creates a treadmill, right? That's the treadmill of accumulation. I mean, this is one of the great insights of the Marxists is that you have this cycle where you have money and commodities uh, are produced and then consumed and then you have more money, right? And that's mm. the cycle that is destroying the planet. That's the cycle that's mm. leading us down this road of ecological apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. You know, you just to get back to your question, though, Rachel, you asked what other bright green lies do we talk about in the book? What what do I think is important? To me, this is one of the most important ones. I'm actually working on an article about this right now. It's about solutions, right? And Great. it's about it's about degrowth, the type of things that you talked about. How do we start to stabilize and then reduce consumption? stabilize and then reduce population growth? How do we get things moving in the opposite direction? Those aren't very technically challenging things to do, 
we actually have a very good understanding of the types of policies that would lead in those directions. Yes. They're politically very difficult to do, right? We, here in the United States, obviously, we have two wings of the capitalist party. We have the Democrats and the Republicans. They're both earth destroyers, 100%. They're both corporate by, uh, captured by corporate interests, and they're both fully committed to empire and expansion of power. So the conclusion of this article that I'm working on, we're going to go through all these different things, population, you know, reduction, relocalization, mm -hmm. scaling down the amount of energy we use dramatically and, mm -hmm. and, you know, restoring the natural world and so on. And then at the end of the article, our conclusion is going to be, this isn't happening right now. And it's not very likely to happen mm -hmm. voluntarily, right? We don't see signs of this shifting. Despite the fact that, you know, aware, like I said, awareness of these issues is kind of at an all time high. Yeah. Everyone understands these things. I yeah. was at a hotel a couple of years ago for an event and I was talking to the hotel worker. You just met him before, you know, and he asked, what's your event about? I said, well, it's about how industrial civilization is destroying the planet and we're in a really bad situation. We're sort of headed for ecological collapse. We're already in the early stages, not early stages, probably middle stages or late stages of ecological collapse. And he did not bat an eye. He just said, yeah, you're exactly right. I think about this all mm. the time. I'm really worried for the world that my grandchildren are going to inherit. Mm. So this is like, this is in the zeitgeist, right? Everyone really, a lot of people really understand this. Unless you're a total nut job, of which there are unfortunately a lot out there who really buy into the ideology of progress and technology and everything's going to be fine. Like a lot of people really understand these issues at their fundamental issue because they're not, they're not complicated. Like we can, we can get all complicated and get philosophical and go down these paths, but really like a fifth grader can understand these issues, right? Mm -hmm. If you have... 10 M&Ms and you're with your friends and you keep eating them and then there are eight and then there are seven and then there are five and then there are two, you're going to run out. That's the situation <laughs> we're in with the planet, right? We're yeah. just destroying it faster than it can regenerate and sustain itself. Yeah. It's very, very, very simple. Mm. And, and yet everything is getting worse. Everything is headed in the wrong direction. Every indicator of ecological health is headed in completely the wrong direction. Yeah. And that's it, why I say these are issues of power. And I don't think we're going to address this ultimately with education. I think education is part of it. But I think ultimately we are entering a very revolutionary period. And, you know, I'm not, I don't call myself a Marxist, but I, I study Marxism just like I study, you know, things from the mil U.S. military or the corporate world, you know, just learn from wherever you can. That's my philosophy. And Lenin, back in uh, the 19, I don't remember when he wrote it, uh, back in the early 1900s, the Russian Revolution was 1919, right? Or was it 14? Shows how much of a historian I am. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, you just called but me he, out, <laughs> he So Lenin wrote that... Revolution isn't really something that people make happen. That revolutions arise because of historical development, because of the natural, natural evolutionary process of a society moving forward. These forces that are larger than we can control, right? And so the Russian Revolution came about because of World War I, because of famine, because of political mismanagement by the Russian regime the czars, right? Because of the poverty and, and uh, disillusionment of the Russian people, all of these factors that are huge, huge. And so what Lenin was saying was that the, the revolutionaries, the actual Bolsheviks, they didn't make the revolution happen. The revolutionary moment naturally arose because of circumstances in society, and they took advantage of it. Hmm. So my argument today is somewhat similar to this. We are in an extremely revolutionary time because of this naturally evolving 
contradiction between industrial civilization and the natural world. Mm -hmm. They are incompatible, mm -hmm. right? And this is, cre this is leading us into an era of extreme instability, political instability, cultural instability, economic instability, climate instability, and so on. And we need to prepare for that in all kinds of different ways. I think there are a lot of different responses to that that are smart, but I think it begins with the recognition that the future is going to be pretty messed up, probably. Like, things are not going to get better. They're likely to get far worse. Uh, and, and, and there are opportunities in that. There are opportunities for us to reassess and change the direction our society is moving in. There are the foundation upon which those in power have built these systems that we live in, like the economic system of capitalism, the governments that we live on, under, et cetera, those systems are becoming increasingly unstable. Mm -hmm. There are positive elements to that and there are negative elements to that, right? Like I'm not interested in total breakdown of civil order and, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, people starving en masse. Yeah. Yeah. Yet, that's where we're headed. That's where governments are taking us right now with the policies that are being enacted, right? Mm -hmm. They're taking us in that direction of total chaos. Mm -hmm. There are opportunities to change that. There mm -hmm. are opportunities for us to choose better directions. And I think that means that we need to be very clear-eyed about the decisions that we're making. And this is where I start to diverge with some of the degrowth people because, you know, like Jason Hickel, you had him on your show. I've got his book right here, actually. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the degrowth people and the eco-socialists and people like that they're more or less advocating a democratic socialist gradual transformation of society towards a lower energy, smaller scale world. I don't think that that is physically realistic. Why? Because, like I said, we don't see any of that happening. That process to be done effectively is going to take decades because... It takes 10 calories of fossil fuels to put one calorie of food on your plate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We are so dependent upon these systems that are destroying the planet for our yeah. clothing, our shelter, our heating, our food, our medical systems, everything. Yeah. Changing them is going to take a lot of time and a lot of energy. And it's going to involve overturning some very firmly entrenched political orders and systems yeah. of power. Right? There are people working against these transitions. Yeah. And so that's what I think the degrowth people often fail to take into account is that maybe if we had started doing that, like back in the Jimmy Carter era, back 40, 50 years ago, if, if people had taken those warnings seriously and said, okay, we really need to start scaling back here. We really need to start taking this seriously, this ecological yeah. crisis. Then we would be moving in the right direction by now. But we're not. We're actually headed in the wrong direction faster and faster. Mm, mm. <laughs> and so I think increasingly that sort of gradualist approach is becoming obsolete. And I wish it wasn't. I really do. And I think it's worthwhile to invest energy into, the, into those types of efforts. I, I truly do. You know, at the local level, the regional level. But I think that they are unlikely to yield dividends because of... The, the the political momentum that we're in yes i i yes yes but however um i think that degrowth is such an important gateway drug um because if Absolutely. you present to people like hey you know sort of the apocalypse is happening um <laughs> but hey also the revolution is going to be violent like people will stick with what they know because Absolutely. on the off chance that it just doesn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what is exciting about degrowth and the way that they present it, and I do think that it could still be presented even more sort of acutely and manipulatively in a positive way, is that it is a gateway drug for people that maybe otherwise would not want to engage with the reality of the situation to kind of go, oh, okay, so if we just, if we contract and if we reduce and if we relocalize and if we do all of these things and if we have universal basic services and if we have uh, a, a UBI and all this kind of, okay, and so then may, maybe things will be okay. 
that's a wonderful first step for people to take. Mm -hmm. um, and the point is that we do need more. You said it's in the zeitgeist, climate change. Uh, yes, but it's still known as climate change, not the climate mm -hmm. crisis. Like more people need to be aware, not only of the problem, but they also need to believe that there are solutions and not EVs, not in the way mm -hmm. that the way of life will continue. I've, like people need to be presented with the idea that life could be better, that mm -hmm. the apocalypse doesn't need to happen, mm -hmm. that life could actually be better for everybody if we were to make some radical changes. Mm -hmm. Because I worry about relying on, I think we're also in a very revolutionary time. Yeah. And sometimes my friends and I, you know, we sort of like, sprawl on sofas this is such a luxurious image but it's true sprawl on sofas and look at the ceiling and be like why aren't we in the streets like mm -hmm. what what is happening that we are not taking revolutionary action or using violence for example um and the thing that i think is so different now compared to 19 whenever it was when the russian revolution happened is that things are not local anymore like the power structures that are at play in the world are international the yeah. resources that those people have to use to get their way and to maintain power are so yeah. much more. Like even I also often sort of say, you know, talk about the 99% the and we are the 99%, but even there's a sort of misnomer in that. Like, yes, on numbers, mm -hmm. not in wealth, not in mm -hmm. access, not in resources, not in power, you know? Yeah, if you, if you make 50 grand or more, you're actually in the global 1%. Yeah, yeah, in the global 1%. But yeah. it, you know, it's also not the global 1% that is, like, it's, uh, careful, Rich. The um, ruling class. You're talking about the ruling class. I'm talking class. about the ruling class. I'm talking, yeah, 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 yeah I'm talking yeah. about the ruling class. The people with their fingers on buttons and hands on yeah. levers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 0 yeah, 0.01%. You know, there's, there's a, this is really fun discussion, by the way. So, oh, you're having fun. I'm, oh, good. I'm jumping in. I'm not trying to interrupt <laughs> or anything. I'm just excited to talk about this because I, I think these conversations are so important. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people get down when they talk about these things. You know, I, don't get down. It's just reality. Like, we're adults. We can deal with this. We can yep. deal with grim stuff, you know, yep. and we have to take care of ourselves and yep. have fun and yep. relax sometimes. And mm -hmm. But this is the reality, and we have to deal with it because we're the adults in the room. It's not, yep. you know, Boris Johnson and, you know, President Biden are not the adults in the room. Yes. They are... Um, they are pathological individuals who are leading us into a very grim future. <laughs> Biden and Bojo is such an interesting example as well, because like Bojo is pathological. I don't think Biden is pathological. I don't think there's actually very much substance to him at all. I think he is such a good example of being a product of your environment in the way that I think if so many people had gone through the exact same experiences as him, they Absolutely. probably would have ended up the same. And Absolutely. to kind of... Like, I'm really against it. I have this thing at the moment of against, like, calling the elite or the ruling class, like, evil. I'm like, I don't want to give them that much mm -hmm. power. I want to call them stupid. I want to call them ignorant. I want to I want to dent their egos. If there's one thing that we all have and we all share and we all have equal access to is language, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't want to think about Bezos as, like, some, you know, evil, creepy, lizard, genius absolutely. man, you know? Yeah, like, absolutely. nah, call him a fucking idiot and see what happens. Like, l rattle them in whatever way is possible. Um, Bojo is pathological because he's a pathological, like, narcissist, mm -hmm. but psychopath or, like, head leading the world towards destruction. And maybe even these people are not aware of how much power they have, actually. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think that when you say that these people are a product of their environment, I think you're exactly right. I was just having this conversation with my partner yesterday. We were taking a walk. And we were talking about whiteness in this country, in the United States, and how the, the formation of a white American identity is wrapped up in uh, colonizers literally being the foot soldiers of colonization in this country. So mm. either being slave owners themselves in the case of the wealthy or uh, participating in and condoning the system of slavery, yeah. taking the side of, of the slaveholders and participating in and condoning and celebrating the genocide of indigenous people in this country. Like that psychology of individuals, you know, you talk about the PTSD of soldiers who go to Iraq or Afghanistan. 
Imagine the PTSD of literally carrying out genocide. Yeah. You know, on a point. on a weekly, daily, monthly, yearly basis. Mm. You know, slaughtering people in villages and attacking men, women, and children just brutally again and again. That is like that that's the ancestors of you know, I don't know if that's my ancestors directly. Some of them came here to this country later, but probably some of my ancestors were directly involved in that, right? Like that's yeah. the psychology that's been passed down. So when I think about people like uh, Joe Biden, who have this American exceptionalism, this incessant focus on empire and militarism and sort of mm. a very masculine dominance thing. Mm. That is the psychology that has come out of those historical traumas, right? Yeah. Like, I think there's so much historical trauma within the Black community here in the United States from, from the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow and so on, um, and in yeah. the indigenous communities. And so, you know, my friends in those communities, you know, they, we, we talk about these issues all the time. White people, we have our own historical traumas, like, the British were doing some really, can I swear on your show? Go for it. So, okay, some really fucked up shit yeah. all over the world, right? Yeah. And that was being, that was being done by like 19-year-old kids yeah. Yeah. who then would come yeah. home and get married to somebody and have kids and like yeah. probably be traumatized as fuck yeah. and, and pass on these like very pathological ways of being. So when you say people are a product of their environment, I completely agree. And I think that we are so deeply traumatized across our culture from the amount of genocide that has taken place and the destruction of the natural world, the ecological displacement repeatedly, um, that, that what seems normal is really a, a pathological mental state, right? Like people like yeah. Joe Biden, he's not, I agree, Joe Biden is not like um, the textbook definition of a um, psychopath or something like that. And yet there are these cultural elements of psychopathy that sort of get adopted as, as just normal, right? Yeah. Just normal. And I that's why I think about people like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, people like that. You know, John Trudell, the American Indian activist in this country, used the term idiots with high IQs. Mm. And that's what I think about when I think about those type of people. You know, the, obviously, I think a lot of them are, are known to be on the autism spectrum. Very genius people like Elon Musk is smart. He's intelligent. Like he's a really smart guy. You don't get to be the smartest guy in the world. Right. In one way. But he has no wisdom. He has no <laughs> common sense. He has no empathy. He has. I mean, I've read some biographies of him and the dude is psychologically messed up. Like yeah. He is a twisted individual in some very serious ways. Mm. And. He's, he's kind of an idiot with a high IQ, you know? And I contrast this with, like, I've been spending a lot of time over the past year and a half fighting this lithium mine in Nevada and spending time with these indigenous elders, many of whom, all of whom, grew up extremely poor on a very rural Indian reservation, um, don't have much education, um, and... They are some of the smartest people I know in mm -hmm. terms of wisdom and common sense and these, this, these fundamental sensibilities that are mm -hmm. far more important than whether you know how to program a good computer or, Values, you know, engineer right? a good, yeah. yeah, spacecraft. Like, yeah. and I really think this is incredibly important because technology is not just a computer. It's not just a smartphone. It's not just... Uh, an electric car. Technology includes our stories, our culture, our way of being, the way that we transmit information to children and to the next generation. And in that sense, many different cultures around the world have developed throughout human history this incredible technology of sustainability. The technology 
that allows you to live in place for hundreds or thousands of generations, more or less without harming the land. That is the most sophisticated technology that human beings have developed. Because our ancestors at some point recognized that we are powerful, we are extremely powerful, we're smart, we have these opposable thumbs, we have these big brains, these social tools to communicate and work together in groups. And those powers allow us to do terrible things. And sometimes they even allow us to deceive ourselves into thinking those terrible things are wonderful things, right? And so when we can rein ourselves in and um, master ourselves, that to me is the true height of sort of humanity embodying its potential. It's not a nuclear reactor. It's not a, a man on the moon. It's not, you know, the latest and greatest app. It's human beings over generations passing down information to one another and living in such a way that they create a paradise for future generations. That is the most sophisticated and important technology that human beings have ever developed and can ever develop. And that technology is not only lost in our modern world, it's actively being destroyed. So much of what you've just said over the past five, ten minutes is deeply, I find, um, profound and has created a lot of new connections for me, especially this idea of the epigenetics mm -hmm. of colonialism and that as a trauma and then applying that. I think actually, Max, um, I think we should leave it on that very profound note of sustainability as technology of the capacity for, for human beings, of the, the sickness that we are obviously experiencing within ourselves and then projecting onto the world as well. Um, thank you. So that's, I'm, I'm, I'm quite moved, actually. Yeah, thank you. Uh, of, of course, though, my final question is, who would you like to platform? Well, thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate this. This, this has been a fun conversation. And really knowing is. that you've spoken with the people that you have and knowing that the audience has likely listened to those people is great because it allows me to build on some of those understandings. And like I said, you've had a lot of great guests on this show. So um, I'm really grateful to, to get to join you. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you, really. <laughs> um, I mentioned Richard York. Yeah. I would definitely recommend speaking with him. He's brilliant. He works at the University of Oregon. He's a sociologist. And his research is fascinating. Um, I would also recommend Dar Jamail. Um, Dar is a fascinating man. He's a friend of mine. He, back in 2000 and, I don't know when it was, 2004, when the Iraq war broke out, he wasn't a journalist, but he just decided the corporate media coverage of this war is atrocious and we need the truth. And so he bought a plane ticket and he went to Iraq and he reported yes. on the ground. Yes, I've years. heard about this guy. Yes, you know him? Yes, yes. He's a wonderful, wonderful, amazing human being. He then went on to focus on global warming. Right. And he is very open about the fact that between his time in a war zone and reporting on the front lines of climate change, he has a lot of PTSD. Mm. Um, but he is an incredibly brave and compassionate man. And um, I would strongly recommend him. The third person that I would recommend is my friend Lear Keith, who I co-wrote Bright Green Lies with. What I would actually recommend talking with her about is agriculture, because she is an expert on agriculture. Agriculture as one of the foundational human activities that's destroying the planet, as one of uh, the origins of global warming and of ecological destruction, mm. and of the links between agriculture and patriarchy, agriculture and imperialism and war mm. and sustainability. Um, I think this is something that's overlooked. It's a hard topic, mm. um, but I think it's incredibly important. And um, she's a brilliant speaker and poet as well. So people always enjoy listening to her. I would love to speak with her. Max, thank you so much for your time. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Rachel.
If you want to learn more about Max's work, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon. The link is also in the description box below. As always, a huge thank you to the Planet Critical community who make all of this work possible. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.